The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. This is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the final video in my Intro to Orchestration series. Throughout the past nine videos, we've touched on various topics. Why and how you should focus your efforts on building a solid sense of craft. What the orchestrator's life looks like, along with some tips on how to build toward that goal. And even some basics on what is and isn't at the root of a professional approach to scoring. The only thing left to discuss by way of an introduction to orchestration is to examine the role of the orchestrator in art and culture. What justifies our existence? And what's our responsibility in ensuring this role will continue into the future? The answer to those questions lies at the very core of our humanity. The human species is basically a creative animal. That's our strength. The very act of communication, making a sentence and speaking it, is creative and constructive. But as artists, we bear the responsibility of absorbing the collective creativity around us, recasting it with our imaginations and tempering it with our craft. There are so many of us now that the amount of change one individual artist can make is very small. But we serve like pixels on a screen. The more of us there are, the more that art takes hold on our culture and the brighter and more beautiful the image of who we are as a species. In that sense, every artist has relevance. The essential history of humanity, once you strip away the endless procession of names and dates, is a series of the invention of ideas. Some ideas persisted for a day, or a year, or a generation, but were eventually abandoned. Yet some ideas took hold universally and reshaped culture on a permanent basis. One such was the idea of the creative professional musician, who then reinvented the way music was performed and preserved, which then reshaped the identity of that musician into the role of a professional composer. That archetypal person lives through all of us today. Through the act of assuming that identity, we each change its definition personally and collectively evolve it. That doesn't mean that everyone who composes or who says they're a composer is a composer. There's an old joke, usually shared around conservatories, that if you were to randomly call people listed in the Manhattan white pages, one person out of five would claim to be a composer. What this means is that the personal definition of composer needs to be re-examined. It has to stop being something everyone presumes they are without any real effort or self-reflection. Here's an example of what I mean. Most people who put their minds to it can play the piano with a bit of practice. But a pianist is someone whose identity belongs to their pursuit of the instrument, which is proven by the simple act of listening to them play. The same is true of being a composer. On a professional level, the term has no meaning without discipline, craft, imagination, and achievement or the will to attain these qualities through dedicated study. But definitions aren't enough to justify our existence as a community of composers and orchestrators. We have to become active participants in the dialogue that determines the survival of our art. It's not sufficient anymore to sit on our hands and complain 
or lock ourselves into ivory towers, watching helplessly as the future of orchestral music slowly erodes through apathy, mismanagement, and arrogance. Therefore, I challenge you all, change the world. There are thousands of you out there. Some of you have channels here on YouTube, or Facebook pages, or in some other way engage in social media. Some of you don't, but at least watch these videos from time to time. It doesn't matter. The future of orchestral music lies in your hands as creators. Many of you are already professionals, and many, many more want to become professionals. Well and good. So change the system by working from within and without. One way we can do that is by changing the way we present ourselves as artists. How many times have you looked at a composer bio on a website or concert program or CD that's a dry list of schools attended, awards won, grants bestowed, and fellowships enjoyed? There's sometimes not a single bit of humanity in its description of a composer's creative life. Nothing that relates it directly to the culture in which the composer lives, nor who they are as people. The impression the reader accumulates from so many identical lists is that composers are becoming ever more products of a system rather than individual people and agents of change. Who is going to be reading your bio? That's what you have to ask yourself. If your intended reader is someone exactly like you, then so be it. But that shuts out everyone else in the world and just becomes another way of talking to yourself. Just remember, you don't have to list every accomplishment, every award, and every distinction. It's enough for most readers to know that you've lived a full life in music up to the point when you wrote your bio, and for them to see the context in which the bio is presented. If it's for a CD, what is it about your musical life that informs your recorded work? If it's for a website, how does your bio justify the trouble of making one in the first place? Focus on what the reader needs to know about you, and stockpile your achievements in a separate trophy room, or save it for your CV. What else needs to change? How about the role of orchestral music in society? That's desperately needed for composers and audience members. In the past 100 years, society has become ever more informal, democratized, and reliant on international communication. The internet is the ultimate outcome of that evolution. Over that same period, orchestras have focused more and more upon preservation of older music, rather than catching the spirit of present-day culture. Contemporary composers tried almost everything to become relevant within the structure. Shock. Until we all got bored. Shaking things up, which was like trying to budge an elephant sometimes. And assaults on the castle walls, which I discussed in the last Intro to Orchestration video but very few have tried getting involved as a community and affecting change collectively, building their own audiences individually, sharing those audiences composer to composer, and connecting them region to region. The American Composers Forum has experimented with this model, but it's like dipping a pinky toe into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It never seems to get the whole foot in the water, much less up to the knee. Frank Zappa has been associated very strongly with the Edgard Varese quote, The present-day composer refuses to die. But what few Zappa fans, or even his composer followers, realize is that the quote is all out of context. Zappa used the quote in a defiant way, insisting on his right to define himself as a living artist of significance. But Varese's original statement was not about individualism at all. Instead, it was about collective action by living composers in defiance of the attempt to turn concert music into a sacred relic. The present-day composers refuse to die. They have realized the necessity of banding together and fighting for the right of each individual to secure a fair and free presentation of his work. Varese wrote this statement for the Manifesto of the International Composers Guild, which he helped to found along with Carlos Salzedo. 
It's a very different world today than when the ICG was formed. A lot of the battles they fought were lost, or were buried under economic collapse, world war, and then the development of today's consumerist society. But the basic driving need for artistic communities is even stronger today. What is an artistic community? In the past, it's been localized groups of talented people coming together to create art, usually in ways that reflect their culture, and sometimes become its iconic voice. These communities also reflect the way things run in their societies, sometimes as a family, or as a collective, or a syndicate, or even as a dictatorship. Recently, I've seen such organizations run like corporations, with boards that raise funds and vote on initiatives. But then something funny happened over the past two decades, the rise of the Internet. That has changed the way we communicate, live our lives, and access information and opinion in a global way. All previous presumptions are now obsolete. We can now, each of us, decide what we want to do in this world of instant access, the way we want to do it, how we want to share it, and what we think about it. We don't need to go through an endless list of gatekeepers to have access to an audience. We are the first generation of internet composers. We get to decide what that means. And those decisions may have an effect on what is done with music on the internet for the next century or more. Even the humblest of us shares the responsibility to improve not only ourselves, but also the process by which we share our creativity. We have the unique opportunity here to change the world by changing the way it thinks of new concert and film music. And we should accept that challenge. Our very survival is at stake. Let's break things down here. The entire world is made up of people who do know and don't know what orchestral music is. Of those that do know, a substantial proportion aren't even aware that new orchestral music is being performed. They think that concert music sort of faded out a hundred years ago if they think about it at all. Then there are people who do know that concert music is still being composed. And here it gets less simple. There's a category of people who know about it but refuse to listen to it or acknowledge it. Then there are those that assume it's all either an attempt to be extremely atonal or repetitive or neo-something or some sort of weird pop crossover. They listen for the style, the context, the connection to some sort of movement. But they don't listen for the voice of the composer because they don't think they need to. And then there are those rare listeners who do listen for the individual voice of the new concert music composer. If there's a lesson we can learn from popular music, it's that artists can be appreciated for their individuality even more than for the movement or style of which they're a part. And we can turn that lesson around in rebuilding the concert music audience of the future. We can show people that contemporary concert music has just as much variety and interest as the whole of popular music. Some of their musical taste may have a resonance with some facet of today's concert music, perhaps even yours. Help listeners to build on that toward a wider appreciation of all music. If we don't start working on the audience of the future, there will be no future in which to compose orchestrally. Any small group of people can get together and make any kind of music they like. But it takes a society to run an orchestra. If that society starts insisting on new, relevant concert music, then it will get performed. And who is going to write that music? We are. But why do we need to be the next Mozarts or Beethovens? Let's change that too while we're at it. Beethoven and Mozart were like no composers who came before them. They were so successful artistically that everyone wanted to be like them. Not only that, they personally developed the mold of the freelance professional artist. Could it possibly be that the composers of tomorrow will also redefine the term so successfully that the fundamental definition of who we are will change again? Maybe the geniuses of today should start thinking about what that would look like, instead of trying to be like the people of the past. And while we're at it, let's get around some illusions about what art means. The biggest illusion about art is that some talented person goes and makes it, and then we consume it. We watch it, listen to it, read it, and it inspires us. That may be what art does, but that's not what art means. Art is a process, at least for its creators, by which we invent ourselves in the act of creation. If we don't grow every time we create a new piece of art, then we're no longer artists. We're just transcriptionists, 
taking dictation from the memory of the artists that we used to be. If we can just accept that truth about art, then we can focus on the real dangers. We might dedicate a huge chunk of ourselves to something that will shape us when we don't even know who we'll become. But hopefully we'll discover that well-planned and intelligently executed individual efforts build us one act at a time, until we become human beings and artists beyond what we could imagine. Our lives should be our biggest works of art. Hi everybody, this is Thomas Goss. I'm a professional orchestrator and composer. That's what I do for a living, how I make my money. Um, I live in New Zealand now, but obviously I come from the United States for my accent. Um, I've been composing and orchestrating since I was a teenager. And do you remember this guy? He's talking off the top of his head about orchestration to the video function on a cheap digital camera, never imagining what the consequences of that one act might have. That was me, about six and a half years ago. I was 47 years old, and recently retired from running a performing arts academy for teenagers in Wellington. I'd scaled my activities back drastically after the birth of my son. I wanted to spend at least a couple of years with minimal distractions, and just enjoy giving him the best start on life that I could. I had a lot of free time as a result, and so I started making videos about orchestration in a casual way, along with taking a few commissions here and there to keep my client list growing. It was a very blissful, innocent time, and I had great encouragement and priceless feedback from a lot of different composers across the internet. Thanks to them, and to you, Orchestration Online has grown in a way I never expected, with resources, discussion, artistic growth, and more professional composers and educators taking the time to help others develop. But even more than all that, Orchestration Online changed me in a very positive way, and I thank everyone for being part of that change. You're the best community on the internet as far as I'm concerned, and I'm happy for the opportunity to provide a place for you all to interact. It's like some multi-dimensional transport hub, with the paths of thousands of careers intersecting in one place, and then moving on and returning from other worlds, other galaxies, other universes of experience. If our travels to those other realities are the stronger for having met each other and shared our perspectives about our art and craft, then I've done my job as the station agent. So that's the conclusion of my introduction to orchestration. I hope it'll give you a start down the path toward a fulfilling approach to orchestrating music whether you have professional aspirations or not. Orchestration is the great craft that accompanies the art and science of music. It's a well of inspiration that never runs dry, and a language that changes with every speaker. As I hope I've shown you, it's also an outgrowth of the root of human perception. We're built to think and feel things in a way that great orchestration operates. Furthermore, it's a way of life and an occupation. But remember, Anything worth the dedication of a lifetime will take a lifetime to master. If it were something easy that everyone could do in a couple of years, I wouldn't have dedicated a part of my own life in explaining it to you. But if the opportunities are lacking, then change that world by doing your own thing. If you feel inexperienced, then change your world by composing works that redefine what it means to be you. If people don't know enough about music to appreciate what you're doing, then change their world by making it important to them. Whatever it is that you have to do to compose and grow as a person, do it. Do it and change this brutal, beautiful, stupid, and brilliant world. <laughs>